Hey, ladies and gentlemen, how are you? Good to see you, everyone everyone out there. Uh, it's been a busy day in true crime already. It's been a very busy day. Uh, Marilyn Landis, good to see you. Marlene Clawson, hey, how's it going? Maria, happy to have you here. Lynn D, Emily Knob, I'm sure if other people will rock up. How, how's it going? Maybe everyone fell asleep during the Daybell trial. <laughs> uh, I know a lot of people were watching it. There was a lot of issues today. StreamYard decided to die for about five hours. <laughs> uh, a lot of other people, um, they, there was some weird stuff in the trial. They covered up a part of the uh, gallery and stuff. So it was an eventful day uh, for everyone. <laughs> How's it going, Diamond Heart? Robbie? Good to have you and Laurie. I'm I'm guessing everyone was like, we watched eight hours of trial. We all need a nap. So maybe everyone's gone for a nap. Um, all right. Let's get into it. There is some breaking news in regards to Samantha Murphy. Samantha Murphy, I'm gonna show you. They are looking at a new search location one that hasn't been searched before hey guys how are you I, i'm here i promise and it's a place they haven't searched before it's quite a distance away from all the other locations too here i'm going to show you so the mount clear area is where she went missing and this is sort of around where they had searched uh within about 10 15 kilometers and then they searched this uh, Bunanyong Bushland Reserve. That was the one they searched last month. And now they're searching uh, down here in the Enfield State Park, which is 30 minutes away, about 26, uh, 27 kilometers or 30 minutes away. So quite, quite, a, quite a new and different search location. They're saying it's based on... Um, new intelligence and multiple sources here let's see they said a fresh uh, fresh search has been launched for missing mother of three samantha murphy more than 30 kilometers away from ballarat uh, victorian police said the search would focus on the area of enfield state park highlighted by intelligence derived from a number of sources okay it says the park is less than 30 kilometers away from the where the body of 23-year-old Hannah Maguire was discovered on Friday. I don't believe those uh, two cases are connected, but their connection is that they're both near Ballarat. Uh, the emergency services found her body, this is uh, Hannah's body, inside a burnt-out car in Bushland near State Forest uh, Road in Scarsdale, 25 kilometers south of Ballarat. Uh, Detective Acting Superintendent Mark Hatt said the search would involve a significant number of detectives from the missing person squad and police from a number of specialist areas. So probably the same people who have been working on the case because they've had multiple different uh, people from different, you know, divisions, robbery, homicide, um, missing persons, a bunch of other different uh, sections of Victorian police. It says, I want to assure those in the Ballarat community that police remain focused on doing everything we can to return Samantha to her family. Officers have asked members of, uh, members of the public not to join the search efforts. That's interesting. It seems they want a very clean search. They don't want uh, things being, you know, missed or possibly you know, touched or something. It says police allege Miss Murphy was murdered by Patrick Stephenson, uh, 22, on February 4, after she left her Ballarat East home to go for a morning run. On March 7, Patrick was charged with Miss Murphy's alleged murder, but since then there have been no major breakthroughs. Nope, we haven't had anything except for the search from the other day and now another search. So, this is the yeah, This is the one they did a few weeks ago. Then they did this one, uh, apparently today. So maybe we'll get a big breaking news for the late late show. Maybe for the late late show we might get some good news for once. 
<laughs> uh, Bambi says, I swear if I go to into a, a Heb or HEB shopping again, I will think of Ping calling it a head shop. No, a head shop. You know a head shot? A uh, head shot. Now I'm doing it. Hold on. Yeah, like when I when I search for a head shop, I'll show you. See, uh, a head shop is a head shop is a retail outlet specializing in paraphernalia used for the consumption of cannabis and tobacco, and items related to cannabis culture and related countercultures. Now, yeah, so it's even got a Wikipedia article. Look, see. So I didn't know if that's what, because we often get people who uh, misspell things or spell them in a different way. And the only thing I could relate it to was this. So there you go. So apparently these are quite common in LA and other places. That's a, that's a weird name. The electric fetus. Okay. But yeah, they have like bongs and volcanoes. That's what that shiny silver thing is. It's called a volcano. Um, they're like $700. They're quite expensive. Um, not that I would know. I wouldn't know anything about that. I don't know anything about those type of devices. Uh, yes, there we go. Well, okay. I'm glad I gave you a new shopping experience then. Uh, Kathy Lynch says we had four days of, uh, rain and thunderstorms. Um, Kathy Lynch says never heard of this term. I'd never heard of it either until... Uh, I was watching some Californian streamers and they use that word uh, for those type of stores. We just call it a tobacconist. That's what we call it down here because the tobacconists down here do sell these type of items. So Laurie says, two pot shops in my small town. <laughs> Full of knowledge. I know everything tonight. So, not like other nights where I know nothing. Uh, that's that's how it goes on this channel. Uh, all right. All right. So that's uh, interesting news about uh, Samantha Murphy. I hope I hope this time on the 18th search that they'll actually find her. That would be great because it'd be nice to bring her home. It's been almost, what, three months? Yeah, it's been a long time. And they they just don't know anything more than we know since she went missing, except we know who pot, like allegedly killed her, and uh, that's it. So here's a bit of a map. I guess this is um, the distance between. Oh, this is where Hannah Maguire was killed, I guess, up here near uh, near Buninyong, and down near the Enfield State Park down there is where they're searching today near Enfield. So a bit of a distance. We'll see. There's a photo of uh Samantha if you everyone saw this photo when it came out. That was the last known sighting of her. This is uh this is Miss Maguire. She's the young woman who was killed by her uh, ex partner and her body was found in a burnt out vehicle uh last week and they've arrested that ex-partner now and he'll go to trial for her death too many women too many women being killed it just seems to be like every day well, i mean when you can make a map and be like well this is where one woman was killed and this is where we think another one has been dumped i, I think you you know it's not a good thing it's not a good thing um all i can say is i hope we get a good breaking news this afternoon uh from this search not like the other one the other search got to about 2.30 in the afternoon local time, and they just went, nah, there's nothing here. We're going to give up for the day. <laughs> We're heading home. And it, they didn't even search until 5 o'clock. They just searched it till just after lunch, and then they just decided whatever they were looking for was not at that location. So hopefully this time, better news. Uh, Bambi says, for ones that like to read true crime books, there is a new one coming out about the Houston serial killer accomplice, Elma Henley. Okay, there you go. Bambi's got some book knowledge for you. I, I don't know. <clears throat> I can't say I know that one. The, what is it called? Emla, 
Uh, Elma, Elma Henley. Elma Henley. I don't know that one. Elma Henley. Let's see. Okay. Is a American serial killer incarcerated in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice System. When was his crimes? He was convicted in 1974 for his role as a participant in a series of murders known uh, colloquially as the Houston Mass Murders, in which a minimum of 28 teenage boys and young men were abducted, tortured, R-worded, and murdered by Dean Coral between 1970 and 1973. Henley and David, uh, David Owen Brooks together individually lured many of the victims to his home Henley, then 17 year old, then 17 years old, shot Coral dead on August 8, 1973. Henley is serving six consecutive terms of 99 years for his involvement in the Houston mass murders. So he'll be out in exactly, what, like 594 years. <laughs> we'll see him then. We'll see him then. Maybe, uh, you know. Maybe he'll survive. I don't think so. I think he'll be long dead uh, if he isn't already. No, he's 67 years old right now. He's almost 70. And he's only like not even a quarter of his way through his sentence. So I don't think we'll be seeing him get parole. I, do, I just have a funny feeling. Uh, so yeah, there is a book. Where is this book? Let's have a look. Is it in this article? Uh, no, they haven't updated the the wiki. Let's see if I can find it. Unless Bambi wants to put it in the chat. Let me see if I can Google it and see if it's coming out. Uh, I can't find any that there's, maybe it's just not being shown to me. Maybe Bambi knows what it's called. There we go. It's called, oh, it's that one. I did see that one on the list. Hold on. Here. It looks like there is, here you go. So I don't know if this is the same one. There seems to be a few under this title. It says, win a free print copy of this book. Enter this giveaway. Ten copies available to the US. Give us all your details and we'll leak them to hackers. <laughs> That's probably what will happen. Uh, okay, there you go. So if you are a book person and you like true crime books, this one has a pretty good rating. Uh, four, four stars, just over four stars out of five. So there you go. April 16, coming to a creepy bookstore near you. Or to Amazon. Like you can just go to Amazon <laughs> and buy it. You don't have to go to a creepy bookstore. All right. All right. So I've told you about Samantha. That's good. And, uh, God, I hope they get, get her home. It's been, how many searches are they going to do? They're like, we definitely feel like this is the place based on intelligence. We're definitely going to find her. We're going to use all our resources. And then at 2.30, oh, yeah, this is not quite the location we thought it was. And we'll have to try again. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, that is not the case this time. Okay, let's go back to the US. Uh, actually, no. I want to bring you an update out of the UK first, if I can find it, which is what I always say. Uh, let's go to Cursal. Who's messaging me? Oh, shoot. Hold on, guys. Oh, whatever. Um, it says here that the police were back out again in the Kersal wetlands, or apparently, according to the locals, it is not the Kersal wetlands, it's the Kersal Dale. 
and they don't like it being called the Curse of Wetland. Let me give you an update about what they've been doing today in the uh, search for the man's identity and the search around Kersal for the possibly lower torso of a man that was found. Afternoon, I'm Sergeant Hemmings from here in the Salford district. I'm just here at Kersal Dale where we have a scene on at present. Um, I'm just here with me and my members of staff. We've been here since 7 a.m. this morning. Um, just engaging with the members of the public, trying to reassure them as much as possible. And um, we've had lots of members of the public coming up to us with plenty of questions. We've been able to just engage with them, um, let them know that there are plenty of officers here to ensure that they are safe. Um, as the CSI teams and search teams work tirelessly to work out exactly who this male is that was found. Afternoon, I'm Sergeant Hemmings. So there you go. There, that's the big update. Uh, really not a ton that they know it's more like they're still searching for who this man's identity is they are scouring uh, missing persons records i'm going to show you the article from manchester evening news they said police are still working to identify the man whose remains were found in a nature reserve in salford six days on from the horrific discovery of a torso at Kersal dale the search continues for clues to the identity of the murder victim. They said it was last Thursday, April 4, when the human remains were found by passers-by in the woodlands at Kersal. It is thought he was over 40 years of age, however, tests are continuing to establish his ethnicity. It is understood. A member of the public found the remains wrapped in multiple layers of cellophane near Radford Street. The victim has not been identified, though he is thought to have been dead for a matter of days. When the remains were found um, they said emergency services were f first called to the scene at 5 50 p.m on thursday prompting the, er the erection of an evidence tent in the woods whoever wrote that has a very dark sense of humor uh, a large cordon has remained in place ever since with footpaths taped off and forensic uh, forensic scouring the scene which is what you saw in that video they're still out there in their tyvek suits walking around, looking for things. They And I can tell you, if you live in this immediate area, the police have requested the local council to pause all rubbish collection for this week. So if you had a, if you had a full bin that you put out on the side of the road, they are not collecting any rubbish right now because the police cannot find the rest of this man. They are concerned if they can't find him in the rivers and the park, that maybe the killer used the local rubbish, like rubbish bins, to dispose of the rest of his remains. So right now, if you live in Kersal or around Salford in the greater Manchester area, your bins are not being picked up this week at all. It sounds like they are paused for the moment, and I can. I, they don't have a resume date either. They're saying until the police tell us we can pick them back up. That's all that we can. <laughs> that's all we can do. Basically, they're going to pause it for now. So I was going to try find if there was an update for that. There was a. There was a few people that were tweeting at their local uh, council are going hey why did my bin get picked up and they were you know a little upset uh, let me see if i can find that let's see uh here here's a person from the local area they say Britain is a first world country, no? Well, here are the bins piling up as collections have been cancelled in Salford, Man Manchester. <clears throat> as the police hunt for missing body parts, as they've only found a torso so far. So as you can see, the bins in the local area that should have been collected, I think, yesterday or the day before, uh, are getting quite a little bit overflowy. So the police are going to have to 
figure out something quickly and try get their normal rubbish services back into operation. Cheaters, didn't they stop that show because a guy got stabbed on the on the show? I thought they did. Oh, in the Smoky Mountains? We'll have a look at that. Yep, Angela uh, Angela Connolly says, So there'll be rats and rubbish everywhere. Yes, I think so. Um, <clears throat> I'm just having a look at this. Oh, it's about the Henley. Oh, it's about the murders, the... The Houston one. Uh, yeah, so I'll talk about that a bit later. But yeah, so if you're in the greater Kersal or uh, the area where this murder has possibly taken place, it's going to be a bit of a stinky week. Your uh, your bins are not going to be collected. So that's uh, unfortunate, but they really do need to find the rest of this guy. And uh, yeah. That's interesting. He also says this person that was writing about the bins. I spent the morning exploring the Kersal Craig in Manchester until the police stopped us from completing the route as they were conducting a forensic examination after finding human remains. So this is one of the other areas and the waterways that they're looking into. So as you can see, that area where the remains were found is quite a large, flat area uh, with a lot of bushland scattered in between and riverways as well so hey they've been searching for a week they haven't found anything maybe they're going to have to find a new a new avenue to go down because since the uh since the discovery of his body or part of it they haven't found anything else not an arm not not his head nothing so and they, they still don't know who he is. Uh, they're doing DNA testing and genealogy, apparently, but that takes a lot of time. They're asking for the public here. Anyone who thinks they may have witnessed something suspicious in the Dale area is asked to come forward by calling 101 and quoting log number 2695 of April 4th, 2024, Details can all also be passed anonymously to the independent charity Crime Stoppers on 0800 one They also have a dedicated portal for anyone to submit images or video footage which could help police and can be found. There's a link here. I will post this link in the chat. Just in case on the off chance someone is uh, searching it. There we go. That's the uh, the police uh, upload link for video or photo. So you could uh, upload it there if you have something that can help. Walk police dogs down the lanes. Maybe, maybe like a uh, cadaver dog. Uh, maybe the cadaver dog can smell it in the bin. It's been there for over a week. That's a bit of a decomposition that may have happened. All right, all right, my lovely friends. Let's uh, let's go from the UK to to LA for a second, just for a second. Hey, stop doing that. <laughs> my microphone was going everywhere. Uh, we have a missing person. Uh, her, the missing girl has been identified as Genesis uh, Balbuna, 14. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but I'm sorry, my friend. It says, according to the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, she disappeared on March 31st and was last seen in the 200 block of West 121st Street in South LA. She is described as a Hispanic girl standing... Five feet, two inches tall, weighing around 120 pounds. She has brown eyes, long black hair. She was last seen wearing a black hooded sweatshirt and blue jeans. The girl may have possible 
uh, destination of Pomona, authority said her family has not heard from her since her disappearance and is concerned for her well-being. Anyone who has seen the girl or knows of her whereabouts is asked to call the LASD County Sheriff's Office at 323-568-4918. Anonymous tips can also be provided to the LA Regional Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. Another young person missing in LA. I saw another two that were missing in Ontario, Canada, but when I searched it, I couldn't find anything, and I was like, how can we have two people missing in Canada, but there's no news article about it, and uh, I don't know if I wasn't writing the correct thing, but it was not coming up for me. Their names were uh, Phoebe and Nika. Let me try it. Ontario, Canada. Yeah, like when I search this, nothing comes up. Very odd. But I saw the alert go out over Twitter, but I can't find it. So if one of our Canadian friends knows where I could find that information uh, for Canada. Let me have a look. Amber alert. missingkids.ca Do they have like an actual list? I've never, we haven't done a lot in Canada, unfortunately. Missing children database, maybe? I don't think this, this helps, unfortunately. We'd have to look through every profile. And I can't see the person we're looking for. And a lot of these look like uh, historical. Look here. Like a lot of these look quite old. Hold on, let's go here. Missing kids alert, maybe? I'm just trying to see if there is another way we can look at it. I I I'm at a I'm at a loss. It says that if if there is a missing child in Canada, people will get a SMS. That's but there is no list that you can go and look at. Very odd. Uh, let me just check here. Missing. One hour ago. No, this doesn't help. No. Uh, sorry, guys. I don't know why. Here. Okay, uh, Aboriginal Alert. Ca. Okay, so if we go here, at least one of them that was the name on the list says they were recently found, and they were of Aboriginal slash Indigenous, uh, you know, background. So that was the for this one. Don't know about the other one, unfortunately, but there's an update for that one. I'll keep looking after the show and see if I can find anything else. Yes, Laurie, chat is working. I can see you. We may just be boring people tonight, so no one came. Uh, Angela, what what is that? She says, I remember you talking about it, and my memory is so bad due to B12 deficiency. B12 deficiency is not a uh, is not a uh, joke. 
Yeah, we may have bored people tonight. It's all right, Laurie. There must be something more important on. Um, all right. What's going on? I opened a link and then everything shut down. Are you hacking me, Angela? Oh, no, it was Amy. Amy, are you hacking me? What is this? She sent me, racehorse goes rogue at Sydney train station. All right, well, we'll watch this for a second since Amy sent it in. What is it? Security footage has captured the moment a runaway racehorse ran loose on the platform of a Sydney train station on Friday night. The horse had bolted from its stable on a farm near the station before making its way onto the platform of Warwick Farm Station. It just wants to catch a train. Look, it's like, oh, uh, I just need to go to the city. I got to go to, uh, you know, my horse's anonymous meeting. And uh, it's quite far away. So I need to get onto the, uh, you know, the express train to my meeting. <laughs> Let's see. Is there a little video? And then we have to go back to true crime. Look, it's a good horse. It knows it knows not to go past the yellow line. It's it's been trained to catch a train. It's an unfamiliar looking track and not even a real farm. Passengers at Warwick Farm train station with an even better reason to keep back, as this accidental first time commuter checked out modern transportation. This was actually a well-behaved passenger, if not a uh, unexpected one. Dressed appropriately for the rainy night, the horse wandered onto Platform 1 just before midnight on Friday. Never in a million years would I expect to see that. I want to know where he was going. Was he planning to go down to the city circle, you know, Redfern? The blue grip strip offering these hooves some traction, a sensory overload with every step. An approaching train, surely the main event. Thankfully, we're able to warn our train drivers uh, to take extra care, to look out for animals on the tracks. The train stopped at the station. It didn't open the doors, but um, we were able to catch the horse uh, not too long after that. Not before a quick game of chasey with this frightened man. It's uh, really, really bizarre, like something you don't, that doesn't cross your mind. The end of an adventure, reason enough for the long face, back onto the horse float and leaving quite the tale to tell. It's unclear how exactly the horse who would from its stables nearby, but we're told it's now safely back where it should be and is a little more street smart. So I actually worked in this area growing up a little further away. Actually, I, I used to work at uh, Rose Hill and um, because of the racetrack, there's a lot of stables around for keeping horses and um yeah, that's pretty funny. The horse, I like the guy who ran away from the horse. He, where is he? This guy, look. He's like, oh my God, a horse. And he ran away and the horse is like, wait up, mate. Wait up. I'm friendly. I, I just want to pat. Yeah, lead me by my, by my, uh, you know, my, my lead. I just need a, I need a human to help me. Come back, buddy. <laughs> the guy's like, oh my God, a horse. Hey, buddy. It's so much better to have a horse than, say, a bear or a great white shark. You know, I'd, I'd take a horse any day over, I don't know, a cougar or something like that. An alligator. You know, I don't think you need to be scared of the horse. <laughs> uh, pretty funny story. Thanks, Amy. I think that is hilarious. He'll kill you dead. I don't know. It looks like he just wanted some carrots and a and a pat. He's even still got his uh his keep warm coat on him. So he's stuck out somewhere from his. He must have been put away for the day because he's wearing the the heavy blanket that they put on for them to be like that. They, they take them off when they're supposed to go out uh, onto the track or whatever. So the fact he's wearing that looks like he may someone may have not locked his uh, stable. A hundred percent. It is pretty funny. Yeah, I thought I the thing I think is hilarious. He's so well behaved. He knows not to go past that yellow line, and he actually sat there and stood and waited for the train. Like, yes, I'm supposed to be here. I I'm supposed to actually live here. 
pretty funny. Uh, thanks, Amy, for sending that in because that is hilarious. Uh, let's see. Warwick Farm. Now, my... Yeah, that Warwick Farm's right near... Hold on. Oh, it's on the other side. Sorry. Uh, that's near... near Liverpool and Cabramatta. See, my, my knowledge of Sydney is not as good as it used to be. Near Fairfield and Cabravale. Cabravale Diggers Club that everyone sees on the train heading into Liverpool. It's down near, um, yeah, a bit, bit further away from Rose Hill. But Rose Hill is very similar. It has Rose, uh, Rose Hill Gardens race course. And uh, they have a lot of different uh, stables up there. Uh, I used to work in the stables as a teenager, uh, shoveling like hay and throwing up bales <laughs> at like 5 a.m. in the morning. And they used to pay us like 100 bucks in cash, which sounded like a lot for a young kid, but I, I'm sure they were ripping us off because $100 for about six hours work is not a lot of money. So there we go. All right. There's a race course near Liverpool. I'm sure there is. I can't remember it, but I'm sure there is. Go to the Diggers Club. You know, I, I've seen it a million times on the train, like going from like Liverpool to Fairfield or whatever, and I've never been to it. <laughs> you can see it every time, but I've, I've never been to it. Uh, Shad, hey Shad, how are you, my friend? Well, he did kind of jump when the train came through. He kind of uh, did jump. You can see near the end. But like, I love this photo. It just, it's perfect. They need to put that in an advertising campaign. Just like, you know, we take all types of customers on our trains, including horses. Poor buddy. He probably was pretty frightened. I just like this one. Look, come back. Hey, mate, I just want to, I want a carrot and a, and a pat on the head. Come here. Pretty funny. But yeah, no, poor thing. Yeah, but this is when the train came through here. And he the, he had his back turned to the train at the time, and I think it uh probably freaked him out a little bit. Right, surely the yeah, main startled event. him, spooked him. Poor little buddy. Um, all right. <laughs> no, no more uh horses, but it is pretty cute. Okay, we have more stories we have to get to from America, and I just got to find it. Where is my one? Okay, here. From the, Mil from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. With more names, Ping can't pronounce, probably. It says, Maxwell Anderson appears in Milwaukee uh, County Circuit Court as prosecutors were seeking to detain Anderson for an additional 72 hours before making a charging decision on Tuesday, April 9, 2024, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It says a 19-year-old woman reported missing, her family fearing the worst. A leg found along Lake Michigan shoreline. Uh, oh, I don't even know how to pronounce that. Hold on. Let's see. I should have done this before he jumped on. Here. Kudahe. That's how it's telling me. Kudahe. That's how it's pronouncing, telling me to pronounce it. Kudahe. A car torched in a Milwaukee alley and human remains discovered nearby days later. And a man described as a person of interest in the dismembered leg case, taken into custody after authorities searched his duplex in Milwaukee's south side. The events have sparked rumors and conspiracy theories as the public tries to understand how or if they are connected. As of Tuesday morning, much of the situation remains unclear. What is known? Investigators have zeroed in on a person of interest, Maxwell S. Anderson. On Tuesday, the 33-year-old Anderson appeared in a Milwaukee County Circuit Court where Prosecutor Ian Vance uh, Curzon asked a court commissioner for more time to make a charging decision and to keep him in custody while he does so. Uh, it says Vance works in a homicide unit of the Milwaukee County District Attorney's Office. Authorities had found blood in the stairwell of Anderson's home and on a comforter, ev evidence that was cited in the probable cause statement submitted to the court on April 6th. 
Since the original probable cause statement was signed, there's been additional evidence recovered by the way, namely of blood evidence. In addition to what's in, indicated in the probable cause statement from the defendant's residence. So they've, there's been additional evidence recovered by way, namely of blood evidence in the defendant's residence. Uh, so does that mean they found even more blood outside of the stairwell? It says he asked for Anderson to be held for an additional 72 hours so he could review the blood testing results from the state crime lab before making a charging decision. The lab expects to have the results uh, completed within two days. He said, I would also like to add that in the interim since that statement was made, there's been additional human body remains recovered and that's also going to be tested. Ugh. It says Anthony Cotton, Anthony's, uh, sorry, Anthony Cotton, Anderson's defense attorney and Anderson's parents appeared in court Tuesday morning. Cotton appeared to allude to Anderson's potential connection to the missing woman in his remarks. Um, he said, he's been arrested now and held for going on four days on nothing more than a written submission to the court indicating that because he supposedly had contact with a missing person and there's some cell tower suspicion that he continues to be remained detained. So Cotton said nothing prevents prosecutors and detectives from continuing to investigate with Anderson out of custody. Anderson, he said, has strong ties to the community, a full-time job, and would return to court if criminally charged. Court Commissioner Geraldine Wendelberger granted the request for a 72-hour extension. Cotton declined to speak with the reporter after the hearing and declined. Comment on behalf of Anderson's family, relatives of the missing woman, Sadie, Carlina Robinson left the courthouse with a victim advocate after meeting with the prosecutor following the hearing. Anderson has several past convictions related to domestic violence, including a case in which he assaulted a family member and in another which he beat a man who tried to intervene when he saw Anderson and a woman arguing. Sounds like a great guy. Uh, how are these how these events may be connected? No officials have public, publicly connected Anderson to the disappearance of Robinson, but a timeline of events shows both investigations ramping up in recent days. Robinson was reported missing on April 1. The next day, the severed leg was discovered in Kudahe. The Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office confirmed detectives and deputies searched a house on April 4 near South 39th Street and West Oklahoma Avenue related to the leg and took a person into custody for questioning. Well, often when you uh, you search someone's home in relation to a leg and then take someone into custody, it is very concerning. And they said after that, human remains were found in Milwaukee near North 30th Street and West Lisbon Avenue on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. None of the remains have been identified as of yet, authorities said. They say key locations, and then they put everything in weird colors where you can't see. Why would they not do this in red? Um, says this is where 30th and Lisbon, location of burning car and more human remains was there. And then North 30th and West Galena, more human remains found Monday. It's like a paint by numbers. And it says... Pisa shuttle. Sadie Robinson's place of work is over here. So some remains were found just on the other side of town here. And then what else do we have? There's 39th in Oklahoma, location of arrest. And then leg found over here. So you've got remains spread out all over. <coughs> all over like milwaukee like up here this uh, this is where she worked there was more remains found there like he was this is where he lives over here and then a leg found all the way over near saint francis in kudai or cut it says while the two have not been connected as of yet the milwaukee county sheriff's office is working in partnership with the milwaukee police department 
to investigate the second discovery uh, that was in reference to the severed leg and other human remains. Also on Monday, Milwaukee police said more human remains were discovered a few blocks south near North 30th and West Garlana Streets, but added that investigators had not, deter not determined if they were related to the remains found out found found over the weekend. The Journal Sentinel reporter saw several Milwaukee police detectives searching along the train tracks in the area on Monday afternoon. There you go, there's a photo of them searching along those train tracks. Are they expecting to find more? They said, regardless, the location of North 30th Street and West Lisbon Avenue appears to be significant to the Robinson case. A resident in the area called 911 the morning of April 2nd, the day after Robinson was reported missing, to report a car was on fire in the alley behind her home on North 29th Street, Robinson family members told WISN-TV Channel 12 that detectives said the car belonged to the missing woman. And when the family re returned to the area of North 30th Street and Lisbon Avenue this weekend to search for more clues, they found a distinctive blanket owned by Robinson with her photo printed on it. That's got to be really creepy, right? If you're looking for a loved one and you find a distinctive blanket owned by her with her photo printed on it, that, that must be awful. And that was according to WITITV. Let's see if they have something on this. Body parts found in Milwaukee. Police called twice in 24 hours. Loved ones of a missing Milwaukee woman say they found her blanket in the woods tonight, discovered near a recent crime scene. Fox 6's Durante Matthews joins us live from District 3 where at the Milwaukee Police Department with what the family has to say. And Bill, police wrapped up that search just about an hour ago. They canvassed the same area near where a human body part was found last night around the area of 31st and Galena. Now, Sunday Robinson's loved ones say they found her blanket with her face on it, a picture of her face on it in the woods over there. And they say through the pain, they just want more answers and even justice. Days after his niece's disappearance, David Scarborough II says he's coming to an unsettling conclusion. You have to prepare for the worst and pray for the best. And worst case scenario, Sade's not with us no more. At this point, he says justice is all he wants for 19-year-old Sade Robinson. We need the person to suffer that did this to her. Milwaukee police say Robinson vanished Monday, last seen near Commerce and Pleasant in the Brewers Hill neighborhood, an unusual sign that immediately alerted her family. Sade wouldn't be gone for a week if something didn't happen to her. After five days of searching, on Saturday, loved ones found a pink blanket in the woods near a park at 31st and Galena. They say the blanket had a picture of Sade's face on it. Thanks to these people out here, we, we found a little bit more evidence, but we still don't know everything. Police blocked off the entire area to investigate with the county's medical examiner. Scarborough says Robinson's car was found torched in the same neighborhood Tuesday night. It's nothing that's going to ever replace Sade, but um, we need justice for her. The second time in less than 24 hours after the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office says a human body part was found in the exact same area Friday night. The Sheriff's Office says it and Milwaukee police are investigating that. This comes four days after police found a severed human leg in Cudahy. That is being investigated as a homicide. That investigation had state crime lab investigators at a Southside home near 39th in Oklahoma Thursday and Friday. Police have not said whether either investigation is connected to Sade's disappearance. And Scarborough is asking for anyone with any information about Sade's disappearance to please come forward. Police and the sheriff's office did not respond to our calls or emails for an update tonight, but we did. How did they pronounce her name? It was, uh, it's spelled sort of like, um, like Sadie, but that's not how they pronounced her name. Hold on. You hear a detective saying it's with any information about in Oklahoma Thursday. That investigation had state crime lab investigators at a Southside home near 39th in Oklahoma Thursday and Friday. Police have not said whether either investigation is connected to Sade's disappearance. Sade? Is that how they pronounce it? Like with a hard A? Sade? Okay. So it's, it's uh, spelled a little differently. Hey, we try to be respectful as we can and pronounce the name right. Uh, but what an awful... 
I can't imagine what they felt when they fell that found that blanket with her. Like they knew it was hers because it has her freaking photo on it. It must have been something she was given when she was maybe born or for a birthday milestone or something like that. Maybe it was handmade by a relative or something like that. I'm not sure, but it might be something like something you would put in like a hope chest or something like that, you know, as you got older. Very awful. It says body part found. Neighbors told Fox 6 that Friday night's investigation centered around 31st and Galena Avenue on a Galena playground. Just south of 30th and Lisbon, the park neighborhood is within the jurisdiction of the police department, but the sheriff's office said it also is involved in the investigation. Police blocked off in canvassed an alley and the park and were searched well past midnight. Uh, a resident said, it's just shocking. What is really going on over here? The neighborhood is supposed to be peaceful. Well, sort of. Not when you have missing women and body parts turning up. It's not that peaceful. Yeah, so this is the way they spell the name. It's S-A-D-E. Um, yeah, Sade, I guess. And uh, it says, relatives of the missing woman told Fox 6 News they found her blanket, which has her picture of her face on it, in a wooded area near the park on Saturday. That woman, 19-year-old Sade Robinson, was last seen in the Brewers Hill neighborhood on April 1st. It, it was an unusual sign that immediately alerted her family. I guess, yeah, I mean, why else would her blanket be there? That you don't just be like, oh, they made 50 of these. No, like, there's just one of them. It's very concerning. They said, thanks to these people out here, we found a little more evidence, but we still don't know everything. Yeah, that's going to be a hard journey for that family. I can't imagine. It says, uh, Robinson's uncle, who joined other family members at the scene, you have to prepare for the worst and pray for the best. And the worst case scenario, Sade's not with us anymore. That's very sad. It says Scarborough told Fox 6 that his niece's car was found torched in the same neighborhood on Tuesday night. It sounds like they may sort of understand how most of this happened, but they're waiting for the evidence uh, to be able to charge, uh, charge that guy. I can't believe his lawyer was like, yeah, let's just let him out on the street. He's a good guy. He works nine to five. Let's get him out onto the... Let's get him back to his house. You know, the one with all the blood in it. I often want to get my clients back there. Ah, <laughs> uh, very awful. Hold on, let me search his name. Maxwell Anderson from Milwaukee. Here's a photo of him, by the way. Here's a photo of him in his, in his best orange Sunday best. Uh, what's his name? Maxwell Anderson. From here, TMJ4 News had an update four hours ago. Still no charges in the severed leg investigation. Today we did learn more about the person in custody in that gruesome case. He is 33-year-old Maxwell Anderson. He's still being called a person of interest, and he is locked up on probable cause. Investigators have found four body parts across three different locations across Milwaukee. The one in Warnemont Park, the only one confirmed to be connected to Maxwell. During a search last night, officials say a search team found new discoveries in Warnemont Park. Still not exactly clear what they discovered. Meanwhile, search crews back out today looking for 19-year-old Shade Robinson. She's been missing since April 1st. The next day, her car was found burned out near 30th in Lisbon not far from where some of those human remains have been found. Investigators are still not linking Sade's disappearance to Maxwell Anderson or to any of the human body parts. Megan Lee, though, digging into Maxwell's past. She joins us live from downtown with what you've been able to find out today. Megan? Yes, yeah, Steve, ever since we found out that Maxwell Anderson was a person of interest in the severed leg investigation, we've been digging in deeper, trying to find out 
who Anderson is. I mean, today I learned that he did work at Dukes on Water as well as some other bars in the area, and he used to frequent this area a lot. We also dug into his criminal history. 33-year-old Maxwell Anderson is in custody as a person of interest in the severed leg found in Cudahy April 2nd. However, this isn't his first run-in with the law. Court records show Anderson has a history of disorderly conduct. In a five-year span from 2014 to 2019, the Milwaukee man pleaded guilty to three separate counts of disorderly conduct, as well as criminal damage to property and intimidating a witness. Most recently, Anderson was found guilty on a second offense OWI. Now Anderson is in Milwaukee County Sheriff's custody as the only known person of interest in the severed leg investigation. Prosecutors were in court Tuesday morning asking for an extension to hold Anderson longer without charges. This comes as investigators are waiting for test results. A court commissioner granted a prosecution request to extend a probable cause hold on Anderson for 72 more hours. Anderson's attorney declined to make a comment. However, he said if Anderson is charged, he would reconsider. Steve? Megan, any word on when we could see those charges? Um, I did hear from the district attorney's office today, and they said that no charging decisions would be made. So it's, you know, five o'clock now. So I, I don't know if those decisions would be made this evening, but we can probably expect any word on charges in the coming days. Live in Milwaukee, Megan Lee. At the end there, they say, when can we expect charges? Well, obviously before the 72 hours is up, otherwise, what are you going to do? You're going to be like, sure, buddy, head back to your house full of blood. We'll see you next week, all right? Don't run away. Be back here next week so we can arrest you, okay? Don't run. We will find you. Be a good boy and you stay at your blood-filled home, okay? No, they're going to arrest, they're going to charge him in the next 72 hours. So that was a silly question at the end. Of course, they're going to charge him in the next 72 hours. Um, Milwaukee has an awesome zoo besides that. Stay away from that town. Okay, I'll take that advice, even though I'll probably never go there. Um, I had to go back to this. Hold on. Where is it? Kathy Lynch asked me about a story we did about body parts in a tree. I don't remember. I know we spoke. Did we tell you one? There was a girl in a tree that hit a motorcycle, like she was on a motorcycle or something, and then hit something and then flipped up into a tree. Guys, we, we do, we do like 50 stories a week. I, I can't remember all of them, unfortunately. I don't remember the one about body parts in a tree, although we probably did do it. I just can't remember. Uh, you know, I can't remember the stories we did from last Friday, um, unless it's something we've done over and over again. Sometimes these smaller ones that we pick up, I can't always remember. Um, $250 to see her in St. Louis? Oh, that's a lot. Hey, JDR, how are you? I wasn't into either. I wasn't into either. Um, someone said how to pronounce her name right. Thanks, Angela. Sade with a with a H. Okay, not a not a hard A with a with a H. Okay, it was hard for me to hear. I don't have um, I don't have my headphones in. They're over like here, like to not annoy the microphone because if they're too close to the mic, you'll get like a buzzing. So they're sort of over there, so I can't fully hear. Um, but thank you for that. Uh, Marlene Clawson said. The guy who murdered a family and then hid their bodies in a tree kidnapped a teen girl. He was into trees and leaves. Oh, okay. The guy who murdered a family. Okay, I can't, I can't seem to remember that one. Um, Nancy has ticket prices are ridiculous. Actually, when I went, I went and saw Chris Rock, and I paid $100 a ticket. It was really fair pricing. I had a great night, and it was a bucket list uh comedian that i really really enjoyed it, i was really stoked to go see him very very happy um there was kevin hart coming out and Ch uh, dave Chappelle. i wanted to see them too as well 
they were asking $200 plus per ticket. And I was like, I'm not paying that. Like, how come Chris Rock can ask $100 a ticket? And these guys who are in uh, the same group of, you know, comedian friends, they ask for double. And I'm like, it's ridiculous. Because in America, if you went to the same show, you got to see Dave Chappelle, Kevin Hart, and Chris Rock at the same, like, event. And in Australia, we had to pay three times <laughs> to see the same show. So that was for my uh, that was for my thirty eighth birthday. I I went and saw Chris Rock. It was a great, great, uh, really great night. I've been wanting to see him for like twenty years, and um, yeah, did not disappoint. He was great fun. Uh, all right, hold on, my friends. I just want to check something here in regards to. I'll keep an eye on this one. If they uh, if they arrest and charge Maxwell, I will get it to you. But I wanted to show you a little bit. About, there's not been a ton of information about the missing Kansas moms, uh, the two ladies, Jillian Kelly and Veronica Butler from uh, Hugerton in Kansas. I haven't heard a lot. But one day ago, they released some drone footage on News Nation, and I wanted to show it to you to two mothers who disappeared. 27-year-old Veronica Butler and 39-year-old Jillian Kelly went missing March 30th. They were traveling to pick up Butler's kids amid a custody battle with her ex, but they never arrived. Police found their car empty and abandoned on the side of this road you see here in Texas County, Oklahoma. News Nation has been on the ground in Oklahoma, but so far have seen no evidence of search efforts by police. Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation says it is looking in the area that the car was found, but locals tell us they haven't seen any signs of a search. So where do police think these two missing women are? News Nation correspondent Laura Engel joins us now live from Hugoton, Kansas, where both the women lived. Laura, are you hearing anything new from law enforcement? You know, we've been reaching out to people all day long, Elizabeth. The OSBI telling us just this afternoon uh, that they are continuing their search and they hope that they will be able to find these women alive. Still, uh, we've been talking with people all day long in this town, uh, many who do not want to go on camera. In fact, all of them don't want to go on camera. Uh, and they all seem to know somebody. Everybody knows somebody, which means they might know somebody who could be involved or have information. Everybody seems to be pretty fearful of talking with us, uh, but still the answer is out there. They want it to know where these women are. And we have video to show you. Uh, one friend of Veronica Butler told us this feels like a black cloud has really uh, been hanging over them, just hoping that they are going to be okay after their abandoned vehicle was found on that rural dirt road we told you about in Oklahoma in uh, Texas County, Oklahoma, Easter weekend. We got our drone up and over the scene of this extremely desolate area to show you what the terrain looks like and how far away the nearest town or working gas station is from where the SUV was found, where investigators say there were signs of foul play. We also walked the road where the vehicle was found. Take a look here. So right down at the end of this dirt road is Highway 95. We are on Road L, and you can see we're a pretty good distance in. And right down here, we have found a stick with yellow ribbons and flowers. And right over there on that telephone pole is a white cross with yellow flowers and ribbons and the women's name written on that cross. The question here remains, why are we so far down off of this road? What happened that day? when they were driving on Highway 95. Yeah, so that was a little bit surprising to see how far away the car was. We will bring you more when we hear from investigators on the ground. Boy, I hope you Elizabeth. hear something soon. Laura Engel reporting live from Kansas. It's been very strange that we're so far removed from the date where they went missing. We don't know anything more than really the day they went missing. Uh, it's um, it's concerning that we have two moms out there that have haven't been seen in almost what is it almost two weeks now. Uh, it where are they? And it's uh, concerning. I mean, to go missing from such a a rural sort of uh, surrounding, and there's really so little information. There's no real suspect there's no real you know other than 
in evidence indicates foul play. They the OSBI hopes that they're still alive. I would uh, I would I would hope they're alive too, but the more time that we run out, the less likely an option that that seems. It really it really does. Apparently News Nation also had a an article come out about four hours ago recently, and it says here, missing Kansas mums, no signs of large-scale search out in that area, and they're saying the FBI joining the investigation for missing Kansas mums. And it says, the search for two Kansas mothers who disappeared over a week ago continues, with investigators saying little beyond the fact that foul play is suspected. Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly, 39, of Hugerton, Kansas, disappeared after their car was found 1,000 feet off Oklahoma State Highway 95 along a dirt path on March 30. Investigators say they were on their way to visit Butler's children amid an ongoing custody dispute. A couple of weeks ago on this channel, I showed you some documentation detailing just how strenuous and uh, brutal this sort of custody arrangement slash almost accusations of keeping the, her own children uh, hostage from her. And it sounds like a very messy situation that I maybe come to, uh, you know, a boil and it's, uh, it's exploded. It says, News Nation has reached out to the family and friends of the missing women who say they are, get, are getting their information from the OSBI but did not want to comment any further. Meanwhile, investigators are also remaining tight-lipped about the search. Butler and Kelly were headed to an abandoned gas station in a remote area for a child cu custodial pickup as it was the halfway point between Butler's home in Kansas and the children's grandmother's home in Oklahoma. The woman, the women, sorry, not the woman, the women never made it, and the search has been going on since. Residents of Hugerton are devastated by holding out hope that the women will be found. Many have been hesitant to discuss the matter, but one resident says she visited Butler just before she went missing. She says, and I quote, She was so happy she had on a full face of makeup, you know. I'm going to Liberal, and I said, What are you going to do? She went, we're going on a boat with the kids and we're not coming back to Hugerton until Tuesday. In response to the continued inquiry, the OSPI said that it along with other agencies are continuing our search and are hopeful to find both women alone. To find both women alone? I think that means that that is supposed to say they are hopeful to find both women alive. Anyone with additional information can contact the OSBI at tips at osbi.ok.gov. News Nation reported Tuesday that Kelly was a supervisor of the childhood visits for Butler. The two women were in a part of Oklahoma to meet up with a guardian for Butler's children, who are ages 6 and 8. The visit was a designated court-approved visitation that takes place every Saturday. Four people, including Kelly, have been listed as approved supervisors. News Nation reported Tuesday that Butler and her ex-husband were in a bitter custody battle, and just 10 days before the women went missing, Butler had filed a petition in court for more visitation with her children and was seeking full custody. Yes, and she had some very alarming accusations uh, leveled at her ex-husband's mother, uh, saying that she is possessive, frightening, and saying that she weaponizes her own children in a custody battle and yeah there's there's some nasty stuff going on here very nasty stuff uh i hope they find these two ladies i really do it is not does not sound like a good situation at all i'll let you uh watch the little video about the fbi joining the investigation mothers who vanished on a rural road in Oklahoma more than a week ago. The news comes as friends of Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly begin to speak out. They tell us it's getting harder to stay positive as each day goes by and that the two women aren't as the two women aren't found. 
it's like a black cloud is over the top of us. And, and, you know, we want to know that they're okay and they're going to come back. But, you know, as the days roll by, it's just getting harder and harder to um, stay positive and keep the faith. And it's just hard. The women were driving in rural Oklahoma to pick up Butler's kids when for some reason they stopped. Their SUV was found on this deserted road, which as you can see, it's a, from this drone video here, it's remote and it's rural. Since our crews have arrived, they have seen no signs of a search for these women. No canines, no command post, no grid search. But that may all change soon now that the FBI is involved. News Nation correspondent Laura Engel joins us now live from Oklahoma City. Laura, you just spoke to an Oklahoma private investigator. What did she tell you? I did. You know, we have been in a text exchange for the last few days, and she was the person that I reached out to before we headed out to the Oklahoma County area, uh, the Texas County area, where all of this took place. And she was the one to tell me to be very careful in this very remote area uh, to kind of leave a plan with people uh, because this is so remote. There are no, you know, cell towers. There's no cameras anywhere. Um, and so I asked her about specifically what she thinks happened to these women. Listen. I believe that the uh, ladies were most likely uh, taken and something happened to them by more than one person or at least with at least a gun that was there to coerce them to leave or to shoot them and then they left. But I believe it was very bad. I think there's a high possibility, I'm not saying absolute, but a high possibility that the family has something to do with it, perhaps the grandmother. Uh, the uh, uh, child's father or associates of the father, the grandfather, people involved that were in a bitter custody battle dispute that perhaps didn't want to lose custody. Yeah, we've been hearing about this custody battle for Veronica Butler's kids uh, this entire time. Of course, we can't confirm it because the OSBI uh, will not tell us more than they're just searching and continuing and will give us an update. Um, and to your point about not seeing a, a grid search or anything in the area, uh, the only thing that we have seen are a couple of volunteers uh, going around this area, being careful, uh, looking for any signs or clues for these women. Elizabeth? What do we expect to change now that the FBI is involved, Laura? Yeah, I, I confirmed with the FBI today, and they told me only that they are providing resources. And they kind of hesitated when they, they wouldn't tell us much more about their involvement, other than to say the OSBI is the lead. We are providing resources. More to come. So I wonder if those resources are what we tried to speak about last week, which was the cast team with the FBI. Now, what was one of the things we spoke about? It was cell phone data and tracking the two women. They obviously both would have had cell phones on them. So would have the other people who they may have been meeting. So maybe they need those resources to help uh, go through that information. I showed you a little bit of the work they do last week and how complex it is. It's not as easy as just plugging a thing into the computer and being like show me all the information like a genie lamp it doesn't work that way and it can take you know from a couple to several analysts like days and days of work to get this information pass through it get it loaded into the software start doing the like geometry and you know you know the mapping involved in it uh, you know, you see the stuff that like Gray Hughes does, that's like on a basic level similar, but like, you know, look at all the hours he puts into it as one guy and look at the stuff he does very, very good. But, you know, imagine trying to do it for like a court case and then having to find evidence or where two missing people are. It's a lot more complex. And so I wonder if they're the resources that they're getting from the FBI because they have a whole dedicated team that work on this type of stuff and a small police department like the, you know, in Oklahoma, even the OSBI maybe don't have enough people to, um, to do it. So I would be very interested to know which department of the FBI is working on this particular uh, case. That would be very interesting. 
And if it is the cast team, uh, or it doesn't have to be them, they can actually feed into that team through. There's other ways they can get to that um, skill set uh, through the FBI. It doesn't have to be just through them. But I wonder if that is the resources that they're asking for because uh, they may not have enough manpower or knowledge power to be able to do more than like basic or, you know, more complex things. So they may actually need someone that's uh, more educated in the area. So they may not have a specialist in their department or something like that. So it does happen. And that's what the FBI is there for. It's it's there to help uh, smaller agencies when they don't have the the tools or, you know, the people. So let's see. I would be very interested. Maybe we'll find out which uh, segment of the FBI is helping. But knowing the FBI and seeing them in different true crime cases over the years, we'll probably find out nothing. <laughs> nothing until court. They're very, very tight-lipped. Hey, Vicky. Hey, by the way, Vicky, that was very sweet of you to send in um, that donation tonight. Uh, that is more than kind of you. And uh, yeah, that was more than very, very sweet of you. And Vicky says, find out who set up that meeting place. And that's your suspect, I bet. I think we have a general direction to go in, right? Who else would have known they were there on a rural road in the panhandle of Oklahoma? No one, except for the people who organized the meeting. So very, very strange. and. I just hope they can track the track them somehow and find out where they all went after being at Road L and 95. That's that's what they got to find out. Where did they all go after that? And the other question I would ask is this. Did the children even leave their residence on that Saturday? Did they even get into a vehicle and go to that location at all? Or did they never move from that from their grandmother's home? That's what I would like to know that information. Were they ever put into a car and taken to this road? Or were they at the property the entire time? That's what I would, you know, that would be a very big clue. Because you wouldn't bring children to something that might be a little nefarious, would you? You would leave them at home. So. We'll see. I will, hopefully we'll have more information shortly about Veronica Butler and Gillian Kelly. But uh, yeah, I think we have a few pieces of the puzzle for sure. We just don't have enough to, um, to know more. So hopefully we will soon. But interesting that neither the OSBI or the FBI are really giving anything away at this stage. And there's no big, like they said, no... No large uh, line searches or anything like that. Maybe they know something that we don't. We'll find out. We'll find out. All right. How much time? Oh, shoot. We are running late. Okay. Look, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, uh, it says here, the you know, the Apple River trial. Jury starts deliberations. Uh, well, this will be very interesting. It says the jury deliberations got underway on Wednesday. In the trial, the man accused in a deadly stabbing on the Apple River in Wisconsin in July 2022. Deliberations will continue Thursday morning, uh, so they must have broke for the night. The 54-year-old Prior Lake man is facing homicide, attempted murder, and lesser charges, including battery, stemming from the incident which killed 17-year-old Isaac Schumann and hurt four others. We showed a bit of the video from that day a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it says, Prosecutor show me who pulled a knife from his pocket and lashed out at the group that was tubing on the river following a confrontation. He and his attorney say he was just looking for a cell phone and the group of people attacked him, forcing him to defend himself. Uh, we'll, we'll watch this little video here on today's final day. The jury's been sent home for the night after starting deliberations this afternoon in the Apple River Stabbings trial in St. Croix County, Wisconsin. 54-year-old Nikolai Mew from Prior Lake is facing numerous charges connected to the stabbings of several people, including a 17-year-old boy who died. 
Eric Schlu was in court in Hudson for closing arguments and joins us live now. Eric. Yeah, Kevin, the jury deliberated for about four hours this afternoon before headed home. They do have several counts to consider in this trial. Before they got the case handed to them, they heard closing arguments from both sides. Cell phone video captures an encounter between Nikolai Mew and tubers on the Apple River in Somerset, Wisconsin in July 2022. Absolutely senseless and horrific acts of violence. And all Nikolai Mew had to do was walk away. Oh, hey. Prosecutors say Mew came upon some teens, rushed their tubes as the boys yelled at him. That's when women from a different group heard the commotion. Prosecutors say the women yelled for Mew to leave. He had a knife in his hands and then struck one of the women. The video then shows Mew was pushed. Lawyer Corey Tarofsky says Mew feared for his life. It's coming from all sides and from multiple people. And this man who had heart surgery is terrified. Tarofsky says Mew had nowhere to go. They push him. They slap him. They hit him again. They choke him from all directions. And Nick Mew <laughs> acts in self-defense. 17 year old Isaac Schumann was fatally stabbed. Prosecutors say he was trying to push Mew away. The defense says Schumann put his hands on Mew. Four other adults were also stabbed, investigators say, by Mew. During closing arguments, prosecutors say Mew, in their words, lied to investigators, including when he spoke to the sheriff downstream. You didn't see anybody enter? No. Did you see anybody fighting? I, I heard people screaming at each other, yes. The defense says Mew was in shock afterwards. Prosecutors disagree with that view. Because he wanted to come up with a story that he thought would be sufficient to convince people that he acted in self-defense. We know he lied about all of it. The jury returns at 8 o'clock in the morning to continue their deliberations. Before they left for the day, they did tell the judge in the morning they'd like to see some more of that video. We'll be here to let you know it plays out. We're live in Hudson tonight. So what do you guys think? What do you think is going to happen? Uh, do you think it's going to be a quick resolution? They did say they want to see more of that video in the morning. And um, I don't know. Do you think we're going to get a, uh, a verdict for, like tomorrow during the day? Or do you think it's going to be a long one? It'll be interesting. That might be a telling point if it they, they watch a little more of that video and we get an answer before lunch. But um, yeah, this trial, I haven't watched a ton of it myself, or I know we covered it very early on, uh, but someone messaged me today saying, Ping, can you just tell everyone that it's on Verdict Watch in case people want to, you know, there's some people that really like that type of thing, waiting for the verdict. Um, it says, he took the stand on Tuesday and at one point admitted that he lied about the knife involved in the encounter and said he feared for his life. He said he was absolutely not trying to kill anyone and explained his reactions to teens saying he was looking for young girls rather than a phone. He said, I felt frustrated. I felt annoyed. They kept saying it over and over again. It'd be very difficult. Like if you just look at it from a glancing view without, you know, watching all the details of that, it's very hard to know who's the aggressor, who's not the aggressor. Like I know there's only one person with a knife, but you watch that video and it looks like he's being accosted. And yeah, it's, it's, it's hard if you were, if you were out on the outside twice again yesterday that's interesting that they keep going back to that it's interesting hey mama mia how are you good to see you i'm glad to see you murder okay do you reckon it's going to be a fast turnaround or do you think it's going to be a couple of days i'd be interested to know because Sometimes these ones can go on for a while if they have any sticking points or, um, yeah, so that which ones did they ask to watch it? Yes, it says the jury briefly came back into the courtroom Wednesday afternoon and asked to watch a video of the encounter. Jurors had another video request at 4.30 p.m. Then they were dismissed by the day for the judge, by the judge. The jury will resume at 8 a.m. Then we heard they told the judge again in the morning when we come back, we want to watch it a bit more video. So it's interesting because like they're supposed to take a lot of the facts they hear in the actual trial into account and it's funny that they keep asking for that like the video evidence i mean it's still evidence but 
it's interesting that they might be forming some basis of their verdict around it, which I guess it's the only uh, it's the only real look into what happened that day rather than a he said, she said, or they said, or he said, and it's the, you know, it's the only real look into it. Molly Clawson says, I stay away from the river. Too much drinking and bad behavior. Um, is that common in the US where people go there and like party all day and drink a lot? I guess it does happen here with beaches. In Australia, people go to the beach, drink a little too much and get into fights. It tends to happen. Overkill. I guess if you were scared, you would just... Yeah, there's other ways of doing it, so... Lindy says, I think guilty of lesser than first degree murder. Interesting. It'll be interesting. I think maybe you might be right. I don't think you can get anything first degree. I think because you would say it's a it's a not pre just like pre planned. It happens sort of in in the moment. Um, hmm. So it says the defense used its time during closing arguments to emphasize that it was thirteen against one that day on the river, and pointed to the end of the cell phone video played throughout the week to say it's a case of self defense. You have to look at those 14 seconds through his eyes. He thought he was going to die. He thought he was going to suffer serious bodily injury. Um, yeah, we'll see. I'm trying to see if we can find the defense's... Oh, not the defense. The uh, prosecution's final words. Hold on. Uh, it says, the district attorney called... His actions that day, absolutely senseless, horrific acts of violence, adding all that Nicolay had to do was walk away. We talk about that, right? We talk about just walking away. Uh, we we talk about it a lot in um, like divorce situations or breakups of people, but it, it works in a lot of situations. Don't escalate things. Don't try and be the big man or whatever or, you know, don't try to be the super person. Just just walk away. Everything can be walked away from for the most part, unless you know you're in a life or death situation. But um it doesn't need to be killing people. Just walk away, cool off, try and de-escalate. They were smoking weed and drunk. Yeah. That is uh, he put himself in that position. Kids will be kids. Uh, Kenny, Kenny, uh, Vicky K says, did he just happen to have a knife in his swimming trunks? Maybe for fishing? That's here. That's like, I don't know. Maybe he carries a knife around to feel cool. Ah, uh, the knife was for cutting the tires on the tubes. Makes sense. I mean, I know a lot of people who carry those type of, um, what are they called? Like flick, not a flick knife, but they go, you can do it with one hand. They have the little bar on it. So you can go chunk. I have one here somewhere. Um, use it quite a lot. So I know a lot of people who carry them. I mean, I don't carry mine outside the house, but if I was going camping, I might have one. Groups tie their tubes to, oh, to sort of float on the river together and like, so they don't float apart. I get it. I get it. Uh, Angela says she's a great cat. She only became mine after following my dog home one night. Oh, you had a cat follow yourself home? That's pretty cute. Um, Marlene Clawson says the pocket knife. Yeah, is that what you call it? My one's called a lever knife or something. And you've got a little lever on the inside. So when you push it out, it doesn't auto retract. You have to push a little lever on the inside of it to make it close. It doesn't have a button or anything. It's got like a little piece of metal on the inside that you push on and then close the, the blade. Um, yeah. It's not a switchblade. It's called the uh, lever action or something. Lever. Yeah. What's it called? A frame. Sorry, not a lever. It's called a, uh, yeah, a lever lock or a frame lock. A uh, frame lock, yeah. They just look like this. And this is what a lot of people carry. Like for doing different stuff like this or like that. 
like this. They're pretty common. Like a lot of people have them. They got a little like frame lock on the inside where the blade sits when it's closed. You like sort of push on it. You can see this guy doing it here. The inside there, there's a little lever, like a little thing, and you push on it and the blade will close down. They call it a liner lock. Some call it a frame lock. They're slightly different. Um, but, you know, they look like the knives most people have. Some of them have a button. So you, it's still got a frame lock or whatever on the inside, but on the outside, it's got a button that pushes it in so you don't have to grab it from the inside. But, yeah. Marlene Corson says, too big and sharp for me. Nancy S says, I used to tube float years ago. It was fun, but one time a bunch of young drunk guys were fighting with rocks. Fighting with rocks? Do the rocks fight back? Yeah, it was horrible. Thankfully, the park rangers showed up. Don't know of injuries. Hey, Miss K, how are you? Oh my gosh. I didn't say that. I was just reading a comment. I said I understood what she was talking about, uh, that people tie them together. But um, I get your point. Hey, Mel Mac, how are you, my friend? Uh, Mel Mac says, a dull knife is more dangerous than a... Oh, shit, we're way late. All right, guys. Yes, we're late, right? we got to go. You guys made me late. All right, I got to go. I got to get out of here. I got to let get Trish on the air. Hey, I love you all. We'll be back in about an hour and a half, two hours. However long, Trish, she's got a special guest on tonight. Uh, you, you all know her from her channel. You will you will be able to uh, go and watch that. I've got to get out of here, guys. I'll lose Trish's place sitting there tapping her watch. Um, peace out. I love you all. Come back at, at uh, in an hour and a half, two hours, and we'll do this all over again. We'll talk more about this, uh, the Apple River trial when we come back, okay? We'll do more of that on the late show. I love you all. See you later. Go have fun with Trish. She's been on for like 50 hours today. And um, yeah, thank you for the people who donated tonight. I appreciate it. Helps keep the channel running and uh, gets you some more late shows each week. So bye, bye. See you later. Bye-bye.